What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. We got an interview today that's probably going to be a little bit shocking. We're interviewing a guy that's been some dangerous places, USP Canaan, USP Victorville, and he's been through some stuff, as you can see from the thumbnail. Definitely not a place where a 21-year-old should end up, but the feds sometimes will send you into the dungeon. So if you're watching this, pay attention. Matt, the mic's yours, man. Tell the people who you are. Tell them where you're from. And talk a little bit about how you ended up in federal prison, brother. All right. My name's Matt. Driving from Maine, all the way up here on the East Coast. Uh, I was actually born in Europe, but it's a whole other thing. Came from a family of uh, military. Everybody's military. Honestly, everybody. Brothers, mom, fathers, everybody. And uh, just a black sheep. Um, just to grew up in an area, and, uh, you know, fell into drinking, drugs, and there ain't a whole lot to do around here. And, uh, it's working nine to five and, you know, I just, just every day, like some punk kid stuff, you know, stealing booze from a store and this and that and been in and out of County multiple times. And, uh, one day I got a hair across my ass and decided I was going to rob a bank. Heard about it being in the county, my county where I live at, um, they house all the federal inmates for the state. I hear stories, dudes coming in on fed bids, and you know, all the feds are sweet, you know, they're not that bad if you get cut off. And uh, yeah, you know, listen to all that shit and thought, well, I'll rob a bank. Like, I don't got much of a criminal record. And yeah, so, like, I've been talking to a buddy of mine for like a few months, and uh, finally one morning, woke up hungover. And I looked at him and I was like, oh, today's the day. And he was like, all right. We drove some little rural ass town, not far from where I'm living right now. And, uh, I didn't park down the road and, uh, I got out, walked up and I crossed like a cemetery and walked over to this bank. And like, I was walking up to the doors. I already wrote in the note, mind you, I had it said, uh, give me all the money in the drawer. I don't have to hurt anybody, but I will if I have to. And I had that in my pocket. I had a hoodie on black hoodie backpack. And uh, got to, like, the entryway of the, the bank. And uh, and someone was telling me, like, no, no, no. Like, you, you can't do this, you know. And I just finally, I was like, you know what, fuck it. And I just grabbed the door of the bank, opened it up, walked in. There's some older lady walking out. And uh, I walked in, headed over. There was a chick over by the, um, like, the drive through window. And she, she spun around, come to me at the counter. And she's like, I had oh, my AD, aviator sunglasses on like a beanie hat, the hood pulled up. And uh, she said, can I help you? I said, yeah, I said, can, you, can you cash this for me? I pulled a piece of paper out and I handed it to her. And uh, she took it, she started reading it. I could see her hand start to shake. And uh, she just like shook her head, yeah. And so she reached down, she pulled open a drawer, started grabbing a bunch of money, like just a bunch of bills, like loose ones, throw them on the counter. I grabbed the backpack off and I just started throwing it in there. And mind you, there's a, I don't know, 50, 60 year old lady over to the right of me and the other teller and she's looking at me and she's got like a hand on her hip and I'm just, I kind of looked at her like, you know, it is what it is and back to the other lady at the, the teller and she pulled some more bills out and I threw them in the backpack and she was going and I, and I don't know, I did seem like I was in there for an hour but I guess I was in there less than two minutes from what the detective ended up telling me but um, yeah, I threw the bills in the backpack and you know, I said, and she, I said, is that it? And she said, yeah. And I like, this is what I talk about in hindsight, like, you know, the way they're trained to like do all this stuff. And I said, okay. And I, I zipped my bag up, turned around and walked out. I turned and I looked at her. I said, thank you. And she said, you're welcome. And out the door, I went back, back down to my buddy's car. He was sitting in the car and pulled the passenger door open. I jumped in, you know, throwing the backpack off. And he's like, no, nah, he's kind of laughing and chuckling. He's like, you didn't just do that. I grabbed the backpack out of the back. I unzipped it, pulled it open, and showed him. He was like, holy fuck. So, long story short, that happened. Um, we were both on probation in the state of Maine at the same time. So, we were both at the same PO. So, um, that night, we got all this money. We're going to go out balling and have some fun. So, we hit the local strip club in Portland, the only strip club, and uh, go down there, and he gets a phone call from his mom. She, uh, police were at his house, PO, and uh, his mom's always been kind of crazy. So, like, I told him, like, 
man, your mom's bugging out, yada, yada, yada. And my cell phone had died in all the midst of this. So anyway, he's like, we do this and that. And he ends up driving me back off of my house, my parents' house where I was living. And uh, goes to his house. I basically told him, don't worry, like our PO's pretty chill, yada, yada, yada. And uh, <laughs> I never heard nothing from him again. So uh, I asked my mom next morning, like, oh, and when Dave stopped by, PO stopped by, and she's like, yeah, actually, he was here last night with like a rookie. I was like, oh, really? She said, like, yeah. And uh, I said, do uh, you want anything? She said, no, nah, he was just seeing if you were home. And I was like, oh, all right. What'd you tell him? She's like, well, I told him you were out for the night. He might not be back, you know? And I was like, whatever. And he left. So I was like, oh, everything's cool. It's all gravy. You know what I mean? And uh, the following night, I watched the news. And there was a, like, clip of, like, you know, the uh, corners, the uh, Bangor Savings Bank corners was robbed. Police are looking for further identification, but uh, that was it. Real short and sweet. Let me right ask now. you this: did, did they did they know it was you that night, or was was the pro probation officer yeah. just out driving? Uh, around? This is the whole kicker, the whole thing. I forgot the note. I left the note, and you know they can get fingerprints off paper. Cause use that in the hydrant, and if you leave these papers, you have fingerprints on it. They've got the technology. They put this like stuff on the paper, and then it, they throw in like a machine, and it yanks your your fingerprints right off the paper. That is, if you just touched a piece of glass with greasy hands. How long are you out before they end up coming back and getting you? Four days. Four days later, Four. you're arrested. You're in the county jail. Now you're facing a federal. Few days passed. A few days passed. Um, like I said, I was a vicious drug addict time. We took a ride down to Massachusetts with an ex of mine, bought a whole bunch of drugs, came back, and I was actually going to the local Hannah for the you know the grocery store, and uh, come out of there, and I could see a cruiser was pulling in towards the end of the driveway. And then, like, they, they end up getting me there, basically, long story short. But uh, the chick who does the security at the, the grocery store, she's actually the part-time dispatcher at the police station in town. So she knew they were, like, looking for me, you know? And that's when they, you know, it's, she seen me come in the store, and she called me in. And uh, I did actually, the county that they sent me to to begin with, because it was a state charge at first. It was robbery, state charge. And then, you know, the feds, and I had asked to do it during interrogation, like, the feds would pick us up. And it's like, there might be a chance. So they sent me this, like, bunk-ass county, because Maine's got some pretty hick-ass county jails. And uh, I was there for, like, a week. And then one day, I just got my commissary, and uh, I got a call on my intercom. Driving in a pack of stuff, coming to intake. I don't know why, because like, I ain't got no bail. And I was, like, going on the intake, and there's the, the, the state detective that interviewed me, and he's standing with two plainclothes dudes. And I said to him, he said, like, these are the feds, huh? And he goes, yep, these are the feds. And, uh, yeah, they, they snatched me up there, threw me in there, they drove me down to Portland, Maine, took me to the Portland Federal Courthouse, and got arraigned. I want to talk a little bit about your sentence and going to federal prison and some of the things that happened to you while you were in federal prison, which are just, yeah. you know, these things happen, and I want people to know that oh, yeah. they happen. So let's talk a little bit about that, right? You get sentenced. You end up sentenced to how much time? I got five months, three years paper. Five months, five years, my bad. <laughs> five months, five years, three years paper. Five years, three years paper. How old are you at the time when you get sentenced? 21, 22? 21. What did it feel like to get five years at 21? Were you like, ah, it's five years, I'll be all right? I was, to be honest, I was happy when I got it. Like at first, before I got sentenced, I was really nervous. Like didn't know what was coming. Like I'd only done little like 30, 90 day county bids. You know, never went to the state prison, you know, and I knew I, I I'm smart enough. To, I grabbed like the law books and started looking to see, OK, well, this is like is my guidelines. This is where I should fall in. And I realized I was going to do anything from like four to like seven years. And uh, they gave me the and honestly, when I went and the judge gave me that 60 months, I was happy because I knew five years from now, at very most, I'm out of here, done with this shit, put it behind me and I'm on my way. You know, young white kid from Maine, not really in, in trouble, using drugs. <laughs> you end up going to federal. What's your first federal prison? Uh, Terre Haute. The Just USP? before. Yeah. I wouldn't say that's the thing. Like, I went straight to the USPs. Like, people had told me in my county jail, oh, you go to a medium, you're young, yada, yada, yada. And I was sure, like, you know, the USPs and no joke, you know, wear your boots to the shower, have somebody with you. You know, I mean, that's what I, and then when I got, I never forget when I got on the bus over the holdover place in New Hampshire, and the guy said, give me your name, I'll tell you your, your designation. I gave him my name, and he said, Terra Hut USP. Like, my heart dropped. 
So I'm thinking like, fuck, like USBs, like I've heard like this, not where you want to go. And I mean, the people ain't lying. When you get the USP Terre Haute, right? You pull up there. What's it like your first day? I mean, are the white dudes pressing you as soon as you get there? Are you nervous? Uh, Do you feel like, hey, I'm in danger? What's it like? No, no, it was actually, I mean, it was, I mean, it was kind of welcoming. Like, I mean, yeah, dudes are curious. They want to know who you are, like where you're from. You know, it's, it's very political in there. It's very, all that. Anybody who's been there will know. Um, but no, like, you know, I tell them I'm from Maine. They're like, oh, yeah, you got, you know, the Boston car. It's really not a Maine car here. You know, cars are like what people got to get in. Like if you get to a spot and you say you're from so-and-so or you're from so-and-so or, or you, you know, you're a, you're an Aryan or you're a GD or whatever, there's cars that are, you know, people are, you basically get in the car and then you've got like, usually somebody shot call or they call them, maybe two of them. That's basically the person driving the car and, you know, politics all revolve around that and it's everybody's got their own car. At the Boston car when you were when you went to Terre Haute back then. I don't even remember. I want to say a dude named Steve, but I, don't, I honestly don't remember. That was when I first got in. I was only there for a few months. Was it Stevie Burke? Stevie Riddle? Riddle. Stevie Riddle. Stevie Riddle. He ends up becoming an Aryan Brotherhood gang member. He um yeah. he's running the yard down in Victorville, and I know you ended up there. Yeah, yeah so, I was there. I was there with snow, all that shit. We're going to get into Victorville in a second, though. So what happens at Terre Haute? Why do you leave Terre Haute? I mean, is there a reason why? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, got there, had some money on my books, thinking prison sweet. Like, I mean, it weren't bad. They like, get way better than jail. I just sat out for 10 months, you know? It was like freedom compared to the jail. It was good to go out of yourself for all day, walk around. You can play ball. You can, you know, you can get drugs, you know? And that was my thing. Like, I'm just... A, White boy from Maine used to like getting high. I had vicious drug habit growing up all the time. And uh, no, I was fucking, fucking with the dope, not paying bills on time. And they told me that basically to pay the bill or go ahead and leave the yard. I, I couldn't pay the bill. And I got five years. I'm trying to make it out alive. I'm not trying to be no tough guy. I was 135 pounds. I got locked up. I'm all a five foot eight. I ain't no big guy. I'll never claim to be. You know what I mean? No one take your wins. No one take your losses. Like, you left so, the yard. You ended up. You ended up going up top. Yeah. They don't beat you off the yard or anything like that. No. So you got lucky then. You got to just leave. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That shit. That yeah. I ain't gonna lie. I can say I ain't got my. <laughs> I've gotten my my ass whooped off the yard too. So I've seen some both sides of it. So we'll talk about that in a second. You end up going where after Terre Haute? Canaan. You go to Canaan. So you get to Canaan. When you get to Canaan, you know you checked in. Are you worried about going out on the yard in Canaan? Like, damn, man, I checked in. These dudes might no. get at me. No, only because all my life, like, I've just always been a real, like, honest dude. And I don't think I've ever, like, really told anybody shit that makes them feel like maybe this dude's trying to, like, play me. Like, I, that's mentality I've always kept in life. Like, say I'm out in some neighborhood I shouldn't be. Like, I've always felt like, you know, if the purse pulls up on me saying, Yo, why are you here? Who are you? And I'm 100% honest. Like, hey, man, like, I don't like, I'm just here. Like, I'm not here. You know, I feel like that people can sense from me that, like, he's being honest. Like, he's not, you know. And no, I walked out to Kane and my chin up. Um, <laughs> got in trouble, went to the shoe, being drunk in the yard. Like, I was there for like five months and I uh, ended up in the shoe and chit chatting with a nine tray gangster blood. Here's my celly. And uh, he offered to bring me home and put me on and make me a blood. What, you become a blood in the shoe before you go to Canaan? No, at Canaan. Wow. I knew dude out in the yard. Dude used to run a ticket. He was one of the tickets on the yard. And uh, Nut was his name, Peanut, Renee Ellis. Pretty sure he's doing life still. But uh, he's a nine trade blood, nine trays in New York. And uh, yeah. No, he, we, we clicked a lot, and he was like, you know, trying to become a blood. You want to be a blood? Like, I didn't know what to lose, you know? I want to talk a little bit about your celly, though. You got a celly in USP Canaan, right? Yeah. And, yeah, something, yeah. and something happens over there. But, I mean, if you're a blood, I want yeah. to know how this ends up happening at Canaan. This is, this is the, the, that whole, all that happens, the blood shit happens after all this happens, because we know that that wouldn't fly. 
so had a bit of blood. So let's talk about this, all right? You're in Canaan. Yeah. In all the prison movies and all the prison stories you heard, they come to life for you, don't they? They do. So, uh, yeah, when I had a, a, when I first got there, it was a, a dude was off the bus with me, Stevie Balsam from Boston. The boss car, he'd been in like 12 years. Um, robberies, too. And uh, he was my celly. Seemed like he's a dude at first. Kind of quirky, didn't really understand him. And, uh, yeah, we were cellies for like, I think four months. We, we got there in the yard at the same time, we were in the same cell together. It was an empty cell. We both went in there. And, uh, I just in there one night. I'm sleeping. And I wake up, like a hand on my leg. Kind of like, what the fuck? You know, roll over. And he's standing there looking at me. He's like, what's up? I'm like, nothing what's up get kind of nervous because you know i've heard these stories and i don't know and so he's like he kind of looks down on his right arm and i kind of like see it and he's got a big old fucking you know seven eight inch piece of steel and he goes uh you ever done anything with another guy i'm like no like kind of figuring where this is going at the same time but like not sure what to do like 21 like I don't, you know, so hold on. You're 21. I want people to understand this. You're 21. You're five foot eight, five foot nine, 135 pounds. You got this older dude. He's a, a hardened Damn. criminal convict from Boston, probably a bank robber. I think, I think he had armored car robberies. That he's got a knife too. in his hand and he's like, what's up, dude. Mm-hmm. And in your mind, what are you thinking? Like, Oh shit. I'm honestly, my mind all the time in there was, I'm trying to get home. I want to see my family again. I want to see the people I love again. At all costs, too. Like, you know, that's... I'm not trying to die in there. I'm not trying to be in there and lose all them people while I'm in there. You know, I'm trying to get home as soon as possible and see all those people again. Like, it, it, there was really only just one point in prison, I think, where I was just sitting there, and it kind of hit me. And it was like, stop blaming or thinking it's anybody else's fault. And you realize that it's your fault while you're there. And it's like time just got so much smoother, so much easier. It was like, so no, it was, it was, it was I want to go home, you know? So he's got and this he knife. Off. He's got this knife. The lights are out. Tells me to get down on the floor. Get down here. I jump down. Get down on your knees. Like, he's got a knife right next to my neck. And like, I'm like, you know, you know, go ahead and blow me. Basically is what happens. And. I don't, I don't want to talk about it a whole lot, but I'm not afraid to divulge it. But like, I don't think about it a whole lot. But I mean, I should take a piece of your dignity. That's for damn sure, you know. Yeah, I mean, oh. wow. I mean, does this continue to happen? I mean, are you guys sellies after this? I mean, twice. after this happens, twice. Now, happens, hold on twice, a minute. Hold on, right. hold on. Because people hear these stories all the time. People tell these stories, right? And very seldom do you do an interview where someone actually tells the story like, dude, this is what happened to me. Especially looking at your tattoos on your face, your body. So tell me what happens. I mean, I don't want to know details about, you know, but. No. So that transpired a couple of times. He ended up actually getting locked up on some other shit and yanked off the yard. And, uh, like, I don't know, that matter, like, less than a month later, like, he owed money. He'd been around. He'd been, like, he'd, like he said, he'd been in, like, 12 years. He'd been to, like, I can't even name him, but he, I mean, you know, he's been to Hazleton, Coleman. You I know, know who he is. Yeah. I know who he is. All right. So that's a whole other story. Because I ended up back in Canaan on my violation. Hold on. Because <laughs> I want to know, what is it like, man, after that happens? Does he tell you get in bed, don't tell no one, be quiet? Yeah. Yeah. Get in bed, don't tell anybody. You know, if you do, like, you're not going to want that issue. And, like, I'm thinking, like, I just kind of fresh. And I've never been in no prison at all. You know, it's like my first time in prison. I don't know. You know, after being in there four or five years, you kind of realize, like, okay, this is true. What people are saying, this this really weren't. You know, this like, you know, and you know, thinking like, this motherfucker might kill me, or worse. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm, you know, so got my living, mouth shut. So and by the living, grace of God, he got yanked yeah. off the yard. You're living in fear, but for a month, this shit's going on for a month where he's making you do things. Uh, that you well, no, 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 no. It was twice. It wasn't that bad. 
thankfully. It was like a every so often, like he just get a hair across his ass, and for whatever reason, and like dude, showing like you said, supposedly he had a wife out on the outside and, and kids, nice life, yeah. And like I, I had told some people in hindsight some years down the road, and they like they didn't believe it. Like people that knew him, like they're like, nah, nah, nah. I'm like, <laughs> like. I, you think I'm just going to all of a sudden just, you know, so. Most guys aren't going to make up a story like that and be like, look, man, dude made me play the skin flute oh. or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not to, you know, I, dude, I, I mean, I'm sensitive to the situation and what happened to you. But so now you're living every day, right? Like that. Yeah. Are you, I mean, are you in fear every day? Like, damn, dude. Are you feeling no. some, are you feeling some kind of way? Like, man, I'd like to kill this dude, man. Yeah, I feel in that way, but not necessarily in fear. It was more like I honestly felt like, you know, I don't know if it was like a just being there, kind of that whole like, this is what you did, this is your punishment, like take it and like suck it up and take it. Or, I mean, during the days it was it was nonchalant, it was cool, like it was just, you know, it was like at nighttime, it was a whole different story, but. So who had the car in Canaan, man, for the Boston car? Adam Oliveri there at the time? I was, see, I ran with the main car then. And uh, I don't remember who had the Boston car. You know, I remember Joey getting killed. But I don't honestly remember who. Pooch? Was, no, Pooch wasn't. Pooch Boston was from car. California, man. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Pooch was an AB from California, but um, he yeah, may have had yeah, the yeah. yard. He may have had the whole yard, but maybe not. No, he got years. fucked up over the TV there. Um, yeah, and that was the other thing. Like when I got to federal prison, it's how politicized it is with race, state, area, and like you know, a majority of the white boys being like, "Oh, I'm hail Hitler!" Like I grew up here in a rural ass town in Maine. Like we'd never been on no racist anything up here and to just and i've never been that way around people i mean my mom raised me well like i was raised with great manners like i was never the kid just cut up and like talk reckless like and i just i couldn't deal with the people being like you know this well, we're so much better than all the rest of the races and all like right. no i understand that right but i want to talk <laughs> about dude like the stuff that happened to you like if that happened when we were in uh if that happened when we were in like Big Sandy or something, yeah. we one of the homies did something like that to someone, and you said something, we would definitely do something to him, man. Playing but and and I wanted to, like that was honestly my like gut feeling was like just say something, but like that in the back of my mind, it was just what could happen to me for for saying something. Messed up way to live, man. But that stuff happens. People do get you know uh, yeah. brutalized in prison and I used assaulted. To laugh. I used to laugh at the videos they'd make us watch and all that shit. Like, you know, that'll never happen to me. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Does it you bother know? you today that, that you, to know that a man did that to you? If I think about it, yeah, but at the same time, you know, we, we live and learn. We pick up, move on. I mean, for me to sit around and dwell on that, it ain't going to do me a whole lot of good, you know? I and understand. And you know what? You said that your goal here said your goal was to get out of prison and go home and see your family. I'm going to be honest with you, man. Yeah. If something like that happened, you know, I, I I mean, I mean, hey, different people do different things. You know what I mean? I probably Absolutely. would have, um, I would have probably stabbed them, dude. Without, without, I, a, I, not probably, I would have stabbed them. That would have never happened. I didn't have a knife. I wasn't even like, they, you know, give, 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 if I had three years in, four years in, and something like that arose, that wasn't just fresh on the spot, I, that probably what I would have done. I mean, I, I ended up buck 15, a dude in Victorville, that whole hell, hole. like, you know, I, I, yeah, you know, I didn't, I'm a pretty pacifist dude, quiet dude, but no, it was just, it was, I was fresh. I was new in the system. I, I have nobody that I knew, like I never had family come visit. I hardly ever got letters from home. You know, like I was just one of them dudes that I don't learn how to tattoo in there. You know, I hustled the poker table. That was, you know, I, I I did my time by myself, more or less. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Joey O'Kane. You were over there with the mobster. He he was in USP yeah. Lee with us. I've talked about him before. He was like a germaphobe dude. Like, he made yeah. a celly cut all his arm hair off and 
If yeah. he used the bathroom, he had to sit down and use the bathroom. Um, he yeah, wanted man. you to not use the bath. Hold on, he he wanted you to not use the bathroom, um, in the cell during the day. Go use one of your friends' bathrooms, mm-hmm. and he ends up getting killed in Canaan. Was that in your unit or no? You were right next door. He was almost directly across from me, like between the two units. We get a little walkway between the two because the U shape. We were like flat wall to flat wall, and his cell was like a window or two across from me. But no, he had taken uh, I think his roommate's roommate's toothbrush and wiped his ass with it. Basically, ran up his ass crack put it back you know so he did it in front of somebody that you know where it got somebody else got back to the roommate and yeah the roommate stabbed everyone with dog shit that dude oh he was abusing him he was treating him like he was his lad yeah, that's like he was a yeah, he was, yeah he did that with a bunch of the dudes there he was, you'd be telling him i'm gonna send money to your books you're gonna do this you know get this at store for me and yeah he was doing that with a lot of younger cats and whatnot because he had money really not a good dude so you end up leaving canaan why yeah. do you leave Canaan? <laughs> I uh, hang out in the yard one night, drinking. The first time to drink homebrew. I used to play softball. Softball was my thing at Canaan. They had a great softball yard. And that's really like where I just got out and enjoyed myself five, six days a week. I used to play baseball growing up. Softball was great. I loved it. Loved being able to get down there and just play. But uh, one night in the yard, drinking some wine and heading back in the unit, got pulled to the side for a breathalyzer. Blew too high and going to the hole. You, to the get, hole. you get transferred for that, or do you just be like, dude, I'm done. I'm not going back out. I got transferred for that. Then we're having it. Canyon was like really cracking down because I just before I left, you know, just before just after I left, uh, that one Spanish dude killed that Eric Williams CO there. That was brutal. I I just left like two months before that went down. And Canaan, Canaan was going down the hill. Like as I got there, just from hearing what dudes have been saying it used to be like, a unicorn ended up getting shut down and like what it used to be. And then it was just going down hill. And I remember reading an article not too long ago that saying that it, honestly, out of like all the prisons in the US, Canaan is like one of the fucking worst. And they're all bad, yeah. but you end up leaving Canaan. Where do you go after Canaan? Victorville. Across the U.S. <laughs> they ship you all the way to California, one of the most dangerous prisons at the time, if not the most dangerous. Yeah. I mean, I think that and Big Sandy, what, what 2010, uh, 2011? Yeah, well, I went to Beaumont after there. <laughs> Beaumont was a rocket ship, too. But no, Victorville was <clears throat> Victorville wasn't bad. I got I got put on and let got put on the shoe in Canaan. My my celly not the blood. He put me on a nine tray. So I showed up to Victorville claiming blood. And that worked out for you. Worked out. Fine. He had some other homies that he knew from New York that had been in a minute. Snipe was one of them. Um Face. Like there's a few of them, but then no, it was it was all love. Um they accepted you. I mean, you didn't tell them what happened in Canaan and all that stuff, did you? No, I didn't tell them none of that, no. Absolutely not. Did you hit the yard like you were on some gangster shit? Like, what's up? No. No. I just died. You know, I'm a blood. I, I kind of ended up being the, like the Canaan and fucking terror. I kind of realized what happens when I get out of the yard. Like, you know, and it, when you get there, you really want to, you don't want to go out there bragging and boasting and act like, you know, you just be humble. You get out there, you know, and just keep your chin up and just you, you know you be yourself be respectful because you never know some dude could just got off the phone and found out mom passed away earlier that day and you actually like cut him in line somewhere and dude's had enough you know you just it's you you know what i'm talking about and it's hard to really explain it and put it out there for other people who have an experience to, to, to really get it but it's it's the thing about respect in there but no i showed up to, to victorville and Claim a nine tray and met some homies in my unit. They gave me care package, got all settled in. And uh I was I was good there. I was learning how to tattoo. And I'm gonna I never tattooed in my life. Homie bought a motor for me. I started slinging an ink and I tattoo on the outside now, but I learned with a prison machine and no gloves, using a wet ass sock to wipe people down, like <laughs> you know. Yeah, l- let me let, let's talk about this. How did the white dudes from the West Coast, when you first got there, were they just like, Psh, tell me? Good how- question. They uh, they didn't really care for it, to say the least. But 
they were respectful though too at the same time you know they uh but yeah no they definitely weren't with it they weren't really trying to hear it they would have rather i'd probably not be there but it was you know it, you, you gotta get you gotta learn to get along in there or it's gonna be hell for everybody you know yeah two cars might get into it only these two but it's gonna end up a lockdown it's gonna cause conflict for other people you know it's, it's everybody's gotta learn to get along that's why they got shot callers that's why you got you know to keep things from escalating to atomic levels so let me ask you this were when you were in the hole and this kid you know he groups you up on the nine trade gangster thing and all of that are you in the hole kind of learning everything that you're supposed to learn as far as you know the bloods and you know the oh, yeah. five Liter and all of that literature literature like i read so much about the bloodlines about them coming from the west coast you know who the big homies were learn the lingo like he was he was definitely a homie and he i don't know i guess i just seemed cool enough to him we i used to run his ticket on my range and uh he ended up moving out of his cell because he didn't want some weirdo coming off the, the yard and you know and he asked me like he's like listen you're a cool dude like you want to be a homie i'm like yeah like i mean you know i mean, I mean my boyfriend to... he was always listening to hip-hop and rap and <clears throat> you know one thing it's it's very influential in there you know it's it's and uh yeah, no, that's you know, I I still got the paperwork here, like layers of paperwork of of everything about the homies. So, <laughs> so let me ask you this, right? I mean, you're a white kid from Maine, dude, and you become a blood. It's kind of like what? But <laughs> yeah. let, let let let's talk about this. How about the homies, man? Did they accept you? Did the California West Coast bloods? Or are they kind of like eh? They, they, you know, it's good you say that. They were kind of eh at first, but it's almost like I think probably because they don't see a whole lot of white bloods out there. Because I mean, Victorville's right there by L.A. and shit, Riverside. So like, you, you got some real West Coast motherfuckers there. And uh, at first, no, not really. Some weren't. A lot were. I mean, you get you think at the same time like. And I hate seeing this shit sound like racist, but like you know, some black people meet a cool white boy like me, an old hick from Maine. You know, who's one of the homies can tattoo. You know, I mean, they they showed love. I can't say they didn't. You know, they all really did. Now you're running with the Bloods. Are you still getting high? No. Nah, I had to stop. So tell the people why. I mean, you think, man, if I'm getting high and I run up debt, these Bloods are going to handle that business, huh? That, that as well as it's not permitted under, under our code. Like, it's not, you, that's not something you do. Like, Getting high turns you into a dope fiend, and uh, it just causes problems all the way around. You know, be, be it you ain't showing up for yard, or you got a bill, or you're sick. Uh, you know, it's just not permitted. It's part of the code. It's just not. I know that. I just wanted to ask you. So now, yeah, let, no. let, let me ask you this, right? Mm -hmm. When you first go into prison, you're a young man. You're nervous. You don't know about prison. You're victimized. But are you starting to like kind of get your heart up? Like, man, I'm I'm going hard, man. I ain't letting that shit happen ever again. You're embarrassed, maybe inside. You're like, damn, I can't believe I let someone do this to me. But now you're starting to learn prison, and now you're starting to, you know, I guess you could say transforming into maybe a tough guy to a certain extent. What happens at Victorville? Because you do something that that you have to leave Victorville over, right? Yeah, ended up buck fifty in a dude. We uh, had a cell mine get released. I had my own cell. Well, I had to sell another homie. He got released. And the cell was open for like, you know, just till new people came in or whatever. I ended up getting this dude off the bus. Old creepy dude from Chicago. Been in like 30 something years. Yada, yada, yada. And um, he needed some money. He needed some contact to his people to get some money sent out or whatever. And uh, so I called my mom one night, asked her to, you know, relay, blah, blah, blah. And she was asking me for his info. And I'm just like, here, just like talk to him. So I gave him the phone. And then, like, two weeks later, called mom. And I get, I just got a letter from you, Sully. And I'm like, what? And uh, dude wrote my mom talking all kinds of wild, like, sexual shit. And, like, just creep shit. And, like, she told me, because I'm like, well, what do you write? She's like, listen, the letter's on its way back to you. So I'm like, all right. And, uh, yeah, I got the letter back, and I just... 
dude had gone to the shower one night and uh, coming out of the shower, got his flip flops on, towel around his waist, thinking shit sweet. I made a little homemade. I don't know. I took a pencil with two razor blades, one on each side, wrapped around. I was standing by the doorway. He came to the cell. You know, he's like, oh, what's up? Stop and pull the door open. And I just swung at him, hit him with the right cheek. I got him from his ear to his chin. And uh, yeah, he turned around and run towards the CO station. And they come out, run and tackle us. And yeah, I went to the hole, spent 16 months in Victorville's shoe, waiting for them to. FBI came and talked to me, basically, whether they're not going to charge me. Asked me if I was going to kill the guy because supposedly I'd said, I'm going to kill you, motherfucker. And I never said that because, like I said, begin with, like, I'm trying to go home. I told them that. Like, I'm a little bit more, a little bit more than two years, guys. Like, I'm trying to go home. I'm not trying to kill nobody. You know? And they asked me why I did it. And I told them, like, you wrote a fucked up letter, stole my, my people's address out of my shit at some point, and uh, wrote my mom some fucked up shit. And, and uh, you got the shot from when that happened? No, that's not a funny story. So when I get out, like I ended up this halfway house in Massachusetts and I had all my paperwork. It was a mad, it was basically a county place. They got like 300 county inmates and they got like 20 federal inmates here and it's private money and yada, yada. But I ended up getting in trouble. Fucking, uh, wasn't a dirty urine, but wasn't a clean urine. They took me over to the county jail. It was literally the night before I was getting released. And some kid that I used to hang out with, it was a county inmate at the halfway house grabbed on my property so it didn't get shoved in property there and lost or picked through or whatever. And I've never linked up with that kid again. All my prison photos, all my hour from prison, all my paperwork, all that shit is still, here we are, since 2022. So we're pushing just a little under 10 years of, I don't know if that kid still got my shit. <laughs> I would hope he does, but. Listen, you leave Victorville. Where do you go after yeah. Victorville? Beaumont USP. That's where I finished and wrapped up. Got to got to Beaumont early 2011, mid 2011. Was Richie Left guy there. was Richie guy over there when you went there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He had the yard probably around that time, right? Yeah. And uh, so I get there, and I uh, end up leaving there at uh, mid 2013. And Beaumont was like Victorville was wild. Victorville, I, I saw the ABTs and the uh, TAB, I think it was, go at it one day on the yard. And I watched, and I was, when I was in the shoe for Buck 15, that dude, I'd seen a young white boy and an older white dude come in with just Chad, the marks, the holes. Like you could see up under his armpit, or like young kid, country was his name. And it's like, these are yeah, white boys getting them. But I mean, big old, I walked by it going back to the house from Chow. It was literally, you know, 10, 12 inch piece of steel. You know, only a half inch, inch wide, nothing big wide, nothing like that. So I'm going to go in really easy, come right back out. And there was big white boys standing around them, texting them, like the dudes doing it, like pushing COs out the way. Like that was wild. And, uh, but Beaumont, yeah, Beaumont was a whole nother realm. Oh, it was great. I had a great time there. Don't get me wrong. But... Hold on, man. I got to stop you because I want to know what's a great time about being in prison and away from your family, man. Because I don't want no kids to listen to this and think nothing, prison is a great place. About... I just got to shut my outside door. Hold on. One second. So, folks, he's shutting the door, but the interview is still going real and raw. Oh, yeah, I had to. Sorry. It's cold over here. Um. So, that, I mean, as you said, you said that there's really nothing fun about prison whatsoever. As far as everywhere I was at and been to, Beaumont was the smoothest. It was really the realest place, I guess. Felt the most level. Like, didn't really feel, like, so whack and, like, outlandish. It was really pretty chill spot, a decent warden. But um, there ain't nothing fun about prison not being able to be home with your loved ones. You know, I used to gamble that shit every day when I was before I went to prison. You just think that, you know, basically I'm untouchable. I ain't, ain't nothing going to happen to me. I'm going to be good, you know, and. Really, you weren't untouchable. I mean, things happen to you that don't always happen to you know, the majority of the people in prison, bro. You were victimized in, mm -hmm. in, in the most vicious, most violent, dirtiest, nastiest ways. So you Absolutely. end up leaving Beaumont and you go home, right, from uh -huh. Beaumont. 
You get out of Beaumont. What happens when you're in the street? Something else happens, right? You get in car wrecks and what, what happens? Yeah. Well, I came home from Beaumont to, um, there's a halfway house in Portland, Maine, and there's a halfway house in, uh, Methuen, Mass. It's like the second closest one to Maine. And apparently the one in Maine was full when my halfway house time was up ready. So they sent me to one in Mass. And the one in Mass is also like a work program, like the county jail there. And it literally houses like 400 dudes. But like I said, like 350 of them are county. And you're talking 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 21-year-olds that are just doing county bids, never done that more. And here I am just coming off a USP yard where you respect dudes. You don't just kind of like laugh and run in front of them. You don't just, you know, fuck off all day everywhere, you know? And like, I honestly, I pulled the lieutenant aside second day there. I told the lieutenant, like, listen, whatever you got to do, man, send me back. And he was like, what do you mean, man? I'm like, I cannot do this. Like, this is too much. Granted, like the feds, we did have our own little, like our own bedrooms each. And it was like, you know, nice. Like that. I adjusted, I got in, but that was just, and it reminded me, like I, <laughs> when I got to Beaumont, this is what's funny about Beaumont. When I got to Beaumont, they were on lockdown when we got there. Literally got off the bus shackled and there was a note on the door when we were going in front about visits are canceled to further notice. I'm like, this shit's on lockdown. When we get in, they put us on the yard, get us in our unit, and I don't have no celly. And then I do have a celly, and lo and behold, my celly is somebody else off the bus, too. So we have absolutely nothing in that cell. I read that handbook, I don't know how many times. Like, I read that handbook. <laughs> That's all I had to I wanna, do. I want to get to you getting out of prison, though, because something right. happens in your life that's another traumatic thing happens, right? Let's yeah. talk about that. So, uh, well, I get out, I get out, I come home to my parents' house and uh, get a job doing construction, which I had done before I got locked up. I was working like 60, 80 hours a week, swinging a hammer and uh, paying my restitution, going to drug counseling and uh, smoking weed because, I don't know, I always have. And, well, that didn't fly out of federal because federal is still illegal. So I ended up failing a few times my POs and got to switch to different POs. They get us to run around. And finally, my this one chick I got, she basically gave me an ultimatum. I put an ankle bracelet on you. And her whole reason was that I can't go out and get weed. And I even told her, like, do you not think I can have people just drop it off my house? Like, and she was like, no more smoking weed. So I started drinking like a fish. And uh, I was supposed to be home one night. And uh, I went up the road, right up the road here to my buddy's house. I was already kind of drunk. Got there and uh, got hammered. I ended up cutting my ankle brace off. My PO called me. Where you at? So I'm not home. You know, what are you doing? So I'm going to cut this ankle brace off. No, you're not. So I got a steak knife, cut that band off, threw it on the deck, took a picture, sent it to her. Yeah, my other PO, my ankle brace PO was like, listen, come in Monday morning. We'll put a new one on you. Know, you know, blah, blah, blah. I ended up getting revocated. I had two years, two years and one month left at that time of probation. They offered me a year and a day, go back, to wrap it all up. And I took it. And uh, so this and that. So I went back to revocation. Um, ended up finally getting out February 2016. And uh, met old middle school fling. Chick I lost my virginity to, sweetheart, you know, all this and that. Been friends off and on for 20-something years. We end up hooking up. Shit seems great. I got a buddy of mine that moved from Maine out to Humboldt, California. And we end up chit-chatting. He's like, listen, you come out here, you can trim weed. Like, you make tons of money. I told her. And she's like, all right. So we peel out September 20. 20- 2018, right? No, 2016. Oh, Matt, you, you end up leaving and you go to where you're going to California. Yeah, humble up north, up where they grow up, with your bud and all that. And, you know, this and that, and thinking it's some great lifestyle I'm gonna live. You know, this and that. Get out there, it totally flopped. Um, end up finding out what meth is for the first time. You know, being I'd been clean, hadn't been fucking with anything, smoked a little bit of weed. That was it. Mine and PCQ, no drinking, this and that. But I didn't find out what meth is. The dude we went out there with. And uh, I was, I went from uh, like 160 pounds down to 110. That was a mess. 
absolute mess. And she she wanted to leave. She had enough of it out there in California. She wanted to come home. And uh, so I hit my mom up one day and asked her to Western Union like eight, nine hundred bucks for gas, whatever, to get her home. You know, I mean, we're out in the country out there. But I get to the Western Union. I go back to the car. She's in the passenger seat. I knock on the window. Puts the window down and hand her the money. She's like, what's this? I said, this should get you home. And she looked back at me like, mind you, we've been friends 20-something years. She looked at me, she's like, I'm not leaving without you. So I fought tooth and nail, wasn't going to go, got in the car finally. So we head back to Maine. And uh, I don't know, I was about five days sober, six days sober, cold turkey. And back, you know, across New York, she pulled over one night to stop. One morning, I should say, stop and get some rest. I'd been sleeping. And I'm like, well, I'm going to drive. Just get this done over with. And uh, I get in the driver's seat, start driving about eight o'clock, rush hour traffic, New York City on the thruway um, by Little Falls and Danube, Herkimer. And uh, yeah, there was some cones on the, the breakdown lane, telling people to get over and uh, try to get over. I looked to my left shoulder, looked at my, you know, over my shoulder, looked at my rear view, checked, wanted to go over. And just as I was trying to get over, I felt something bump me in the back. I, I know the vehicle. But I don't know whether it was there trying to get around me or whatever, but I turned back away from the bump, overcorrected. And there was a flatbed truck down on the shoulder with the ramp down. You can look this up. And uh, there's a car behind it getting ready to get towed. That's what they were there for. There was a tow truck behind that. I ended up sideswiping the first tow truck, bumping the car out the way, going up the back of the flatbed. At 65 miles an hour with the girlfriend in the back seat, not even buckled in. The seat's folded down. She's laying down sleeping with the St. Bernard. And uh, yeah, the, the throughway worker was standing on the white line between the flatbed and us. I ended up hitting him and killing him. And uh, yeah. You hit the, the throughway worker and he ends up dying. Yeah. Did that affect you, man, inside? Does it bother you? Do you? Think about Absolutely. it. Sure. Yeah, it's, I'm not going to lie. His daughter actually reached out a couple of years ago. His daughter reached out and told me she forgives me. That really, that helped a lot. Because, I mean, I'm a, you know, yeah, I might have done this shit I've done and, you know, this and that, but I'm really a pretty decent hearted guy. And, like, I don't have my father, but I couldn't imagine, like, it, the fact that I took somebody's father from them, you know, then there'll be another Thanksgiving where she gets to come home and, see her dad there'll never be a she won't ever you know she has a kid she won't be able to ever call her dad and i'm pregnant or you know like i it still bothers me you know not as much as she's reached out to the first they wanted my head the actual the clerk the county where this happened the clerk is the actual widow of this guy so not being from new york none of that i don't have no family as in that like they they put me on the news about a you know a main man accused of running down a throughway worker, done bank robbery. Like they made me look like this bad villain. You know, granted, I and I ain't gonna lie, my mom tell me you know hold that faith, just keep your head up, and that it, it all played out in my favor. But you know, I was honestly stone cold sober. Like I said, like I was just, I was so sober, and I just knew in my heart like I did not do this intentionally. And thankfully, the law actually worked in my favor. And not in my fashion, you say in my favor. Well, I worked how it's supposed to. Because the penal system is just so, these days, there's so much wrong with it. It's so archaic. You know, times have evolved tenfold, but the penal system has stayed where it's at. And it's, it's, it's so detrimental. Look, man, definitely understandable. I'm going to get ready to close the show, but people are going to want to know, what are you doing in your life right now, man? Working, what are you doing? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, we grow, we do medical marijuana growing up here in Maine. It's legal. Medical caregiver. Got a little grow, a little garden I work in. Just live a normal life, but I'm not behind four walls. No, I ain't making a bunch of money. I ain't, you know, but I can't complain. You know, could always be worse. Could always be worse. You could be stuck in a cell in a cell with Steve, and bad things could be happening, right? Or 
any of that. You could be going to bed hungry at night. You're not doing any of that. So, look, man, you've definitely been through some stuff, Matt, and I think we'll probably talk. We're going to talk after right. we get off of here. But, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on, and most people no wouldn't problem. tell the story that you told. They wouldn't want to, you know, reveal what happened to them in prison. So, man, I appreciate you coming on and doing it. It's not just someone telling a story about it. Today it's no you telling problem. about what actually happened to you. So, before we go, hold on. I, it, it happens in there. Before we go, what message would you give to some young man that's on the wrong road? What would you tell them about USP Canaan? What would you tell them? Like, you know, as bad as it may get out here, as bad as it may seem, I mean, they can take it for a grain of salt. They can take it to heart. But I think if they watch more, you should watch any more of your podcasts and hear some of the stories that be a lot worse. Like, that you don't. Something as trivial as being able to come home at night and not even say goodnight to your parents or to a loved one. Just to be able to come home at night and climb in your own bed is a privilege that once you're in there, you ain't got that no more. And it just, it's, it's, you know, haven't been there. It's, it's hard to try to, anybody, it's just, I, you know, I don't, that's a good question. Like, I just, like, I mean, what I just said for an answer, yeah, but it's just, you know, I mean, as bad as you might think it is, as much as people might think that I need to go rob this person. I need to go get this drunk and go drive. And any, like, it don't matter. Like, it's not worth it. It's not. I can tell you from doing those 16 months in the shoe straight, that's like, that's a whole other story. But so we'll, maybe we'll do a part. Maybe we'll do another part. Maybe I'll break this into two parts and we'll do a part three if the people want it. So, look, I'm going to get ready to close the show. We've been on here almost an hour. I appreciate you coming on, sharing your experiences. I hope you keep pushing. I hope you stay free. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. button. Hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. With respect, until tomorrow, we're out.